people attract people, right? Like if you go look at an automotive shop and we all know that your front parking lot's empty and the doors are closed, you're probably not having people walk in the door. Mm -hmm. Let's say you open those doors and you go park all your employees' vehicles out front. Now people are starting to pull in to the to the shop, right? Hey everyone! Thanks again for another uh, tuning in for another episode of the Lift Your Shop podcast. Today we have Troy Kaplan from TJK Automotive. Um, he's going to be sharing us a what, what, with us a wealth of knowledge. So he has a whopping twenty four shops. It's going to be twenty five shops here in a month, and that's spread out over Minnesota and Arizona. Um, so Troy, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with with the audience and the other auto repair shop owners listening, um, a little bit about your story, how you got started in this industry and how you kind of got to building this behemoth of an organization that you've been able to build. Yeah, sounds good. So 1996, I started as a cashier at a gas station, um, was my first job. And that gas station had two service bays and I was the cashier up front, so I rang out uh, clients that had their car fixed in the back, but my main job was, uh, you know, it was a convenience store, so I was ringing out gas and cigarettes and pop and candy bars, you know, that was <laughs> what I, that was my job, and as uh, the year, throughout the year, they had two mechanics in the back of the uh, gas station that worked till 10 o'clock at night. That's when that gas station closed. And oh, wow. I was obviously in high school, so I didn't get there until mid afternoon. And I stayed till 10 o'clock and, and worked. But during the down times or slow times at the gas station part or the C store part, I would go in the back of the, the shop and start monkeying around or helping the, the technicians back there, you know, pulling tires off and changing oil and, cleaning the shop and doing all that stuff. And, and they I built a relationship with the guys in the back and really liked doing that. You know, I was in the back more than I was probably uh, at the front counter. And that really, you know, I enjoyed being in the back. I did not enjoy being a cashier at mm -hmm. the C store. So started spending more time in the back and and talk to the owner and asked if I could, you know, help the guys out more in the back instead of being a cashier and really found that I love to try to fix stuff, right. And, and make repairs. So throughout high school, I ended up working there as like a general service tech or light duty tech and learned a lot from the guys that they had in the back were pretty high level technicians. They had two techs that worked in the day that were ASC certified and one ASC certified tech at night and then I became the general service tech and and that um, gentleman there mentored me and guided me through a lot of stuff taught me a lot of a lot of things after high school was over I decided to go to a college um, to learn more about vehicles and at that time in the in the um tech class or tech school, what I was learning at the beginning of tech school, I had already been doing for like two and a half years at the gas station, right? So I, I it didn't keep my interest. And the guy that owned, the gentleman that owned the gas station had come to me while, it, you know, would still work at night there. He came to me and said, hey, our one of our techs is, is leaving. And if you want to come work here full time during the day, um, I'll pay it. if you want to continue school you could go to school at night or go to classes and, and we could pay for that and at that time you know I was only 18 years old and I was like man I could come here and make a bunch of money and not have to go to school which I'm finding very boring and learn from these guys so that's what I did and you know I was always even in high school a, a hands-on learner not necessarily a good test taker right yeah. I could get I could get to the point to take the test, but when the test came, it's like, uh, I, I didn't I wasn't that great at that stuff. So 
started working there as a technician during the day. And he decided that can, converting his three gas stations and service centers to C stores was more lucrative than having repair shops at the time. So he closed two of his service centers down and the one that I worked at was the last one that he converted to a C store. So in 2000, and in 2000, um, I didn't have a job there anymore as a technician. And we knew that about a year prior, Mm -hmm. six months to a year. So I knew that I'd have to go somewhere else. And I went off and worked at different big box stores, um, tried a dealership for a little bit. I even tried other industries, um, construction and, and different things like that. But that was a short stint. I always came right back to the auto repair because it, it was something new and something different all the time, right? Mm. We worked on all makes and models and it always kept me intrigued and kept me learning. That's why I didn't last very long at the dealership. I didn't find that in, too intriguing. I was doing the same job over and over and over again. And to me, that was boring. You yeah. know, I wasn't, I'm not built for that. <laughs> so, um, as uh, most people, um, growing up and, and learning life, I um, chose good paths and, and bad paths, right? And, and me growing up, I got off to the wrong path more, more often than I should. And at the age of 26, I decided, all right, I either need to go the right way or if I'm going to continue to go the wrong way, it's not going to be a good deal. So mm-hmm. I decided um, working through all these different automotive companies, it was either that they took really good care of the employees or really good care of the customer. Mm-hmm. So I could never find a spot that in that I worked at, and I worked at a decent amount of them that took care of both. Mm-hmm. It was either we got paid really well as technicians and there was some shady stuff going on up front, or the people were well taken care of, the clients were well taken care of, but I didn't, we didn't see the pay in the back follow suit, right? Mm-hmm. And what bothered me is my names were always on those work orders as a technician. So if they weren't doing stuff properly up front, that kind of bothered me because I knew my name was on that repair bill, you know? Yes. So I, um, I decided that um, in 2007 that I was going to try to start my own shop and start fixing vehicles myself and and build up a business that took care of the employees if I was able to hire some and make sure that the clients that I fixed their vehicles on I was you know doing everything legitimately and and honest and with integrity Mm-hmm. So I found a, a steel pole barn building in Hugo, Minnesota. And as I was working for a friend of mine, just diagnosing cars, um, that's all he wanted me to do. He's like, you come in, diagnose cars, and we'll pay you to do that and we'll fix them. So on my test drives, I found this building and I'm like, man, I, I want to be able to diagnose them and fix them and, and do this for myself. And at the time, I, I had no money, right? My wife now, um, her and I had just started dating, and she had a, she lived in a townhouse in, in Maplewood. And I was like, I'm, I think I'm going to go off on my own and start my own deal. So started as I was doing side jobs um, out of her townhouse garage to save up enough money, which was like three grand for first and last month's rent in this 1800 square foot pole barn. Mm -hmm. Um, I was able to do so. And, and May 1st, 2007, I rolled my toolbox into this shop and the floor jack. And that was it. That's all. Uh, That was all I had. No air compressor, no hoist. I bought one of those uh, white folding tables, you know, that you can mm-hmm. get from like Sam's Club or yeah, yeah. that was my point of sale. Wow. I had the uh, uh, carbon copy work orders was my, um, the way I wrote up tickets, mm-hmm. you know, if I needed some help as far as things gone for the first couple months with wiring diagrams or things I was always 
phone in a friend. Yeah. So then it started to, to build up. I, I was a tech, you know, I planned on going in there and fixing vehicles and that's what I love to do and, and still passionate and, and love the industry. But I didn't know anything about running a business or having employees or, or anything like that. So it was kind of fly by the seat of my pants. Uh huh. Fast forward a few years, I got that shop dialed in. We were um, very successful. I had then hired people for the back and people for the front. My wife helped out in the shop um, doing book work. And I found myself, once I had all these people in the shop, you know, it was a small building. So I wasn't wrenching anymore. And I would, the showroom was super small, right? So yeah. there wasn't room for more than two people in there, mm-hmm. especially once you got a customer up front. So I wasn't on the front counter and I had hired people to work in the back. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> so I started golfing a lot. And that was, you know, three years into mm-hmm. opening up the shop. And my wife, I would come in and she's in the little back office with no air conditioning and like a little closet, right. Doing all the book work. She looked up at me and she's like, you, you're not even 30 years old yet. And you're golfing quite a bit. She's like, you better go find something else to do. (laughs) Be sitting in this back closet sweating. So I decided to open up another shop because I, you know, at that point I was like, man, I miss, wrenching i miss fixing cars that's what i love to do so mm-hmm. found another building it was an old goodyear building that i actually worked at during the transitions of me trying to find another home to mm-hmm. to work at and so i found that location and the building was empty um so we had enough money saved up i found the dealership that was going out of business and they were having an auction so I went to that auction and we were able to buy it, all the shop stuff that we needed for that store and loaded up a two U-Hauls and brought it to that shop and set it all up. And I started, you know, we had one service writer hired for the front and a couple of techs in the back and then myself. So I started wrenching again mm-hmm. and that only lasted for about three months and I had enough techs there. It was an eight bay facility. Yep. And, um, and then it was, uh, me going up front because it was a big showroom and the, the car count was heavy. Right. And it was <laughs> not an, enough people up one guy up front for the amount of guys in the back and, and, the, the vehicles coming in. So I started service riding. I did that for about six months and then the struggle was real of how do I be in can I be in two places at once? Right. Mm-hmm. And trying to find the right people, which is the the key to our now success. But I didn't know that back then. Right. I knew that I had these good people were coming, but man, they wanted a lot of money. You know, yeah. it's like, oof, I don't know at that. You know, I still, it was, you know, still a struggle to just make everything work. And then it was, all right, this is my baby here that I started now the new location. Now I'm starting to get good people, but these guys are doing one thing this way and we're doing one thing this way. So I can't be here and here at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I guess people are talking about uh, policies and procedures. I should probably figure out what that's all about. Right. So my wife and I started figuring out um, our our uh, culture but how we wanted to operate or how we wanted our culture to be when we are when we can't be in two places at once right Mm -hmm. i was at a meeting this last week and one guy you know defined culture was uh the culture is how is that place operating when you're not there right because that is your your culture Mm -hmm. so Long story short, we uh, we we built policies and procedures, which are still ongoing today. But we then implemented policies and procedures, and having two shops, getting those policies and procedures, and getting them implemented was the. As you said, I have twenty four locations right now. Going back to number one, then having two and implementing implementing that was the hardest 
thing in my whole career that I've ever had to do. And the, and it took a long time. So six years ago, we opened up store number three. And that was with a, a guy that used to work with me as a technician. And him and I parted ways and I wanted him back. And he was working for another competitor and he's like man these guys are letting people open up franchises and if I were to ever do anything different or leave again that's something that I'd want to do so a year goes by and we kind of talked and I'm like man if that's what you want to do why don't we why don't you just go do it and I'll help you Um, because at that time I had two stores and they back again they were both running really well without there so I'm like all right I could help this guy open up a store we could be partners and see how it works so we did that and with an agreement of he gets to be in that store and do the day-to-days and he's the owner operator we came up with that owner operator philosophy is I got my own two stores I don't have the time to be in your store as well Mm -hmm. so he jumped in hands-on and and started running with it and that was six years ago um and then it kind of snowballed from there. We started catching a lot of attention through people in the industry. There's a big chain up here in Minnesota, there across the country, but they, you know, um, they had people that came in and changed their regional structure to people that didn't um, necessarily know the automotive industry were mm-hmm. coming in to be these guys' boss and a lot of corporate changes and and a lot of them guys didn't like it so a lot of them started calling and said hey what if i want to do my own shop and i hired we we did one with number four with one of those guys and then all the people that he knew from the same company started reaching out and pre-covid i got up to eight locations but in pre-COVID, I also sold one location. So right when COVID, before COVID hit, we had seven stores. Um, we've seen a little bit through COVID. I guess I don't know if you want to say it's over or not. But <laughs> yeah. we'll, call it, we'll call it through COVID, we had 133% growth rate. Holy moly. Um, so started COVID with seven locations and here we are today with uh um, 24 locations have another one coming in in the middle of june and as last monday so almost two weeks ago we had 22 locations may may 2nd we opened number 23 and 24 number 23 was here in minnesota rogers and Number 24 was in the Phoenix, Arizona market. Yeah. That's amazing. Like they just, the, the, the growth that you've been able to have, especially, it's, it's, I didn't realize it was like you were at seven pre COVID and then now you've just exploded in growth during one of the hardest times. And that's, that's just incredible. Um, so congratulations on that aspect. And, but so in terms of then that growth of getting, now one location, two locations, three locations, and, and, and more. What do you believe needs to be in line at like a current shop to then feel like, okay, these are all in line. I'm ready now to take that leap to the second one. Right. So having all of your, I just shouldn't say all, right? Because I'm, I'm referring to policies and procedures, having your core base of who you are and how you operate and do everything and it's from you know opening the door in the morning to counting the till down at night how's that process done what are your expectations and having that all laid out and and the reason i say the core basis is because policies and procedures should always be evolving and changing right as Mm -hmm. you know a lot of people added digital inspections in the last few years in our industry well you had a policy or procedure on how you did your inspections on paper in the point of sale system, but then you changed the digital inspections. Now you got to redo your policies and procedures because that changes. And as we all know, COVID was something that we've never experienced. And 
having policies and procedures in place on how do you deal with when an employee when they're sick? How are we dealing with clients now? How are we handling vehicles? So all that stuff's always got to be changing, but the core base of your business should be laid out, right? And that it took me, so May 1st of this year was 15 years in business. So it took me seven years to go from a technician to an actual shop owner Mm -hmm. and figure all that stuff out, right? Like who will, who are we, what are our policies and procedures, and then to write them all down and have a book and all this stuff with two locations. So it took a long time, not saying it takes everybody that long, but I mean, that, uh, Having to answer your question, having a core basis, who, who are you? What's your culture? What's your mission? What's your vision? And how do you operate as a company? You know, what, who, how do you operate? Because all of the staff that you hire, whether it's one location, two, or you get up to 10 or 50, those people need to know how, how you operate, right? Yep, absolutely. And, and defining that and making sure that the people know that if you're acquiring stores or as you continue to grow right so as you said pre-covid seven locations and then now 24 that rapid growth we never lost who we were but our culture as we grew so quick having the people to implement who we are in our culture was a little bit behind our our growth right so Mm -hmm. having that stay in place as you continue to grow is very, very important. So you don't a forget where you came from or who you are, but make sure that everybody around you that's employed with you understands who you are and, and how you're going to grow and what, what's important, right? Making sure that them to us, making sure employees are taken care of and the clients are taken care of pretty simple. Cause if we do that, the success follows, right? So yeah, no, I, I love this. So, so would, would that be how you would say you define your company's culture there at TJK right now? It's just focusing on employees, focusing on customers or what, is there an actual definition that you guys have there? Yeah, we have a mis- mission statement, but I mean, our, our core values is, you know, the, as you can imagine, so we have a little over 260 employees. So with that growth, something that was important to me and, and with that many people and you can only be in one, one spot at one time. Right. Yep. So making sure that we don't lose that family feel, cause that's mm-hmm. how we started. That's kind of what we do. We're involved in all the communities that we're, that we have shops in. Mm-hmm. make sure our staff members know, know that as well. And, and are feel like they're a part of it and make sure that, for us that that doesn't get lost with our growth and you know that it grow, growing from here to there is I'm not going to say it's easy um, and it was a struggle um, but making sure that that wasn't lost was always the main focus but no matter how you try with that fast growth things get left behind right so really making sure we pull all that together and know that our staff members, we all care a ton about them. And without them, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Mm-hmm. Also to make sure that our clients don't see that disconnect either. So yeah, that's, that's our main focus is it's all about people. I think yeah. no matter what business you're in, right. Auto repair, doctors, construction, and you got good people that do what the job that we want them to do, it's going to bring good things and finding good people, as we all know, is, is tough. But once we once you find them, we got to, we got to keep them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that that's a perfect segue into like, how do you go about finding the right people? I mean, you have a big organization now at this point. And so I know you can't be the one to like handhold and handpick all these people to make sure they're the right fit. And so that kind of has to be passed down through your culture and, through kind of the feel of, of, of the company. So I guess what things are you helping the team members do to find the right people? Yeah. And that goes back to the previous one too, I think is, is exactly what you said is the culture, right? Mm-hmm. Our, our employee retention rate is high. Unless 
we decide that they don't fit into our culture Mm -hmm. Uh, or some people, you know, life changes and, and things happen. And some people have to go a different direction because that's what brings them. But having that culture and the rapid growth for us, um, people attract people, right? Like if you go look at an automotive shop and we all know that you're, front parking lots empty and the doors are closed you're probably not having people walk in the door Mm -hmm. let's say you open those doors and you go park all your employees vehicles out front now people are starting to pull in to the to the shop right Mm -hmm. no different for us in in the business side is we've been able to grow and grow fast well people want to be part of something exciting and something that's cool it's obviously attracted a lot of attention here in the twin cities Mm -hmm. but back to the people attract people and when we have a retention rate that we do which is about 94 percent um and if we have that retention rate it's a it's a big world but it's a small world right yeah everybody knows everybody in this industry with through the growth we've been buying existing automotive repair shops we've done two ground ups and we've bought a couple locations that have been shut down or there have been big corporations where they've taken their employees elsewhere Mm -hmm. but went out of that location so we've bought in stores that were fully staffed we try to buy successful locations um therefore as everybody knows successful locations has good people in them So we go in there and try not to change the world. We all fix vehicles, right? So it's not rocket science. We go in there and implement our policies and procedures and obtain those good people. Some of them don't have great people in them. So you got to do what you got to do. But a lot of them have really good people in them. And we're able to obtain those people and attracting with, for us, right? If, if it wasn't for our rapid growth, we wouldn't have to do so much like Indeed or Facebook or Craigslist ads or any of that stuff. Um, Cause we, we stay, you know, our, like I said, our retention rates good, mm-hmm. but with our growth, a acquiring shops that come with great people and then throwing ads on Indeed has worked for us, but you know, with our staff at 260, they all have friends or family or worked somewhere before. And they're like, Hey, this culture is awesome. You should come and work here. Um, and, and that's why we continue. We always try to, whether we need people or not, we're always actively looking to keep our, our benches full, um, with our growth and our shops continuing to grow internally we still have to stay active on hiring. Um, And we decided um, what people want these days is an awesome place to work, good culture. They want to be paid decently. And, you know, benefits is a, is a big thing for Mm -hmm. people, especially with all these big companies out there um, paying entry level areas. Um, a different amount of, you know, good money to come in and, and start up as a kid coming out of school or a young adult or whatever the case may be, you got to be pretty darn competitive nowadays. You go to McDonald's, right. And make 16 to $18 an hour. Mm -hmm. So we started to see all that stuff uh, pre COVID and, and during COVID and our team pulled together and said, Hey, how can we make it? So, People want to come into this industry and try to make a career out of that in our apprenticeship program or, or whatever the case may be. And like, we get, we're going to, we all need to step up our game here because you go to McDonald's some some of our towns and make $18 an hour, you know, you go to Amazon and make 60 grand a year, you know, 20, 20 to $25 an hour. It's like, that's what, that's what we're up against. And if we don't do something in our industry to change that, we're always going to be whining and complaining that we can't get any general service techs that want to 
start by changing oil and tires and cleaning the shop, right? So we did a deal that as long as we have the right people and it's part of our interview process and, and onboarding process is all the employees, nobody should make less than $60,000 that works for us and their benefits are fully paid for. Um, and it's attracted a lot of people. And, mm-hmm. and as you can imagine with that comes the good interviewing styles because a lot of people, yeah, I can have my benefits paid for and make 60 grand. I, I can change oil and, and swap out tires. Yeah. You know, well, we're looking for those people. We're looking for those people that are good at it. You know, the best of the best, we're willing to pay that dollar amount. Plus those guys that a want to do that for the rest of their lives and potentially continue to move up dollar wise. And then obviously the guys that want to start there, but want to be on the apprentice program to be able to move up into a technician level, you know, so Mm -hmm. paying, paying people what they're worth, but what your competition, what what we're up against. Right. Mm -hmm. And the struggle with that is hard because our industry is scared to charge what we should charge for. You know, you, you call a plumber up and it's 300 bucks for them to drive to your house for the first, you know, they try, they charge a fee to drive to your house. No different than us diagnosing it. They're at 300 bucks an hour. No, they have no problem telling you that. You yeah. know, most of our shops, I would say, or I shouldn't say ours, but most automotive repair shops are probably half of that on average, right? I mm-hmm. think what's the industry average? Uh, 120. Yeah. 100, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're not even on the in an industry half of where they're at on average, right? Now, yeah. in our area, we're not the cheapest in town, um, but we do what we have to do to take care of our employees and where we do, you know, we give a different experience or try to give a different experience in our competition. I mean, we're not over the top price, but we're definitely not the least expensive. So that's been the struggle, you know, and I think that if everybody in our industry were just to say, hey, all right, nobody's less than this. Mm -hmm. And if we all did that, we'd be able to hire all kinds of people because we'd be able to pay them really good money. I think somebody did, did a deal on, in some of the automotive stuff you see online, but if we followed inflation and our labor rate followed it since the eighties, our labor rate and the industry should be at two twenty six an hour. And that was last, you know, then the last year. So whatever you want to bump it up towards this year, 3% or six or eight, but Mm -hmm. I mean, we should be, and that's in the independent world. We should be at 226 or higher an hour. And look at where we're a hundred dollars, hundred and six dollars behind that on average mm-hmm. in our industry. And everybody wants to sit and whine about having to hire technicians and we can't get anybody and can't do anything. Well, if anybody doesn't want to step, everybody doesn't step up to the plate and charge accordingly. I mean, we're not ripping people off. No. We need to, if people, I mean, I know most shops out there as I spend a lot of time at STX and vision and, and working with uh, different groups. Um, You know, Greg Bunch and I, I work with the transformers group and, and all those guys are, you know, people out there like, man, we're a week out. We're two weeks out. We're three weeks out. And some of these shops have five bays to 10 bays, but they might only have two or three people working in the back of the shop. Mm-hmm. Or if we were able to hire more people, we'd be able to not be five or five days out or three weeks out. You'd be able to be what you want to be, and that's two days out. Yeah. But that's you know part of the struggle, and I hope something changes with people in our industry because for the people that realize it and know it and see it, it's tough to be at two twenty six an hour when you dude down the road or the gal down the road's 120 yeah 
especially with all the Google and social media stuff, you don't want to be the person to rip people off. And when you're that far apart, people think, think things. That perception is definitely right. the conclusion, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. It would be nice. Maybe that's what you can do. Shout across the United States and say, all right, everybody tomorrow, 226. No more <laughs> than that. Yeah. I mean, it, the automotive industry is an unbelievable, valuable industry where pe- people need it. It's not like it, it, it can just magically go away and people are fine. It's like everyone needs their cars to work. And thus, if you're, if you're in, if it's such a quality that's so necessary, then, I mean, you have to be willing to be able to, yes, I need to pay for these things that come with it. And like, it's not just, I'm just throwing money down the drain and they're just robbing me. It's like, no, they're, they're taking care of your vehicle. So that way you can provide for your family. That way you can go to work and things like that. So it's just like, it's kind of a circular thing, but I mean, it's, it's hard to then see it externally for a lot of people, but hopefully, yes, the awareness can be made that, labor rates can can definitely be afforded to go higher and that way yes then that that helps with being able to hire techs now interest people in even wanting to venture into this industry and be able to work in the shop because they're like if again if i can do bare minimum doing something else rather than a, a harder form of labor but i get paid more to do bare minimum why why would i do that trade-off and so that's where i mean that that all kind of has to work together so yeah, th- thank you for bringing that up and making that awareness um, but we did talk about quite a few things in terms of scaling and, and, and creating more locations. And I think the big thing was policies. So I'm curious on um, how you went about, did you just write them down on pieces of paper? Did you type them up in Word documents? How do you go about first creating them? And then from there, how do you go about implementing them? So I've heard a big thing with a lot of owners is we're like, I wrote, I wrote these procedures, but they don't even follow them. Like they don't even read it. So like, why did I even bother? So then how, how do you go about implementing those things that you created so start first though with the creation right so goes back to the school deal right where i'm good at the legwork but not the test so that that wasn't my strong suit but i had the the vision right so my wife helped me out a ton um i'm able to write everything down on a on a legal pad or a notebook piece of paper and um, put it into policy and procedure words um, is is where she helped out a ton. Um, now we have a gal in HR that that's what she does is all of our policies and procedures. So it was literally, all right, you know, what do, what do we do in the morning? How do we test drive vehicles? How do we do our inspections? How do we answer the phone? So we wrote all those down. They typed them all up and we started, you know, what's, everything that we do on a day-to-day basis, how do, how do we do it, you know, policy and procedure. So finally getting all the, the basics and the core typed up and, and put in there and people go to training events and go to uh, business coaching or classes and learn all these things. Right. And then they come back and they're like, Oh, we're going to change the world. Right. So yep. something that's got to be done with a plan and I, you know, you don't want to, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But if you can make it better, make it better in steps. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if you're implementing all this stuff, you go back and tell my technicians 50 policies tomorrow, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy. (laughs) So figuring out obviously the core stuff. And then we, we literally would at the time we only had two locations, right? So every time we made one, we made a few a week. Um, and then we'd print them out and then we'd have a shop meeting. Um, we have our stores, depending on how old or new they are, they have meetings once a week to five times a week. But at the beginning, we started printing them out and handing them to everybody. And we, we made the people, the technicians or service writer read them. And we all talked about them. Sometimes we miss something or sometimes they had a little bit better idea or a better tweak. I have a lot of people that have been with me since conception and a lot of people with me since conception of store number two. And those guys and gals seen a lot of stuff and evolve. So they're on the, on the ground, boots on the ground and, and or interacting with all these other uh, teammates and for them to give us feedback on how we could be better, you know, all right, yeah, we test drive, you know, technicians like, yep, we should test drive for this amount of time. 
take this amount of turns, do this many drive cycles. So our team helped us write a lot of the, a lot of those up and, and change them. But as, as you said, is you gotta, we gotta do it in steps um, and make sure that everybody knows them. They mm -hmm. all have to sign off on them. Now we have a book, right? An employee handbook. We have policy and procedure book. Those are given out electronically when people start working for us and they have to read them and acknowledge them and, and sign them. Um, and just making sure people understand that this is who we are. This is how we operate. We don't operate like this or this or this. We operate this way. So when you're here, this is how we do things. Now, if you see something that you don't like or we should add or change, we're, we're here to listen. Um, and maybe we can tell you, yeah, we've tried that and done that. Here's what happened. Or, oh, nobody's ever said that. that let's talk about that. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest deal is, accountability hmm. if you don't have you can sit there and make all these notes and all these policies and procedures and have a whole book and hand them to the team and read about them and everybody puts them in their toolbox or their drawer and if the leader of that shop isn't following themselves or isn't implementing them and holding them accountability then you just you just got you need to find a paperweight you know, because it's just a waste of time. So yep. accountability is huge. Um, that's a that's a big one. That and you go and make implement a new policy or procedure for a test drive or or COVID. You know, people mm. you got to your average person's not just going to read that one time and then oh yeah, this is how we do it and then they remember it forever, right? It's not that's not a thing. So talking about it not doing too much at once, implementing it, and then making sure that the people are held accountable to follow how we want it done is huge. That's the key piece, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and so I, I, and I know other owners are listening and there's like, well, Troy, there's one of you. You now have 24, almost 25 shops. How, how are you making sure these other shops are being held accountable? So, I mean, I, are you doing maybe a Zoom meeting with an owner operator once a month? Or how, 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 what does that look like for you kind of being able to manage all these different locations? And I'm sure you're going to grow even more. Right. So are we, as you said, we have owner operators. So there's shareholders in the companies, right? So mm -hmm. they get paid a salary to operate that shop as if they're the store manager, service manager, whatever you would like to vision that as um, but they have stake in the game right so a little bit probably a little bit different for uh, a guy like let's say it was me myself and I had 24 locations with store managers with nobody with stake in in the game right no no shareholder that's a that's a different deal so you'd have to have your district managers, regionals, and, and good store managers, right? For us, we have owner operators, same kind of concept, except they have a little skin in the game. And their job that they get paid a salary to do is to operate that store. Hmm. They have skin in the game where they're an owner operator and they have equity stake. They don't get paid just like I don't get paid or any owners listening you don't get paid unless you're profitable, right? Mm -hmm. So your first paycheck, uh, first paycheck to get cut is, is the owners. Mm -hmm. So unless that store is making money, they don't get paid as an owner's hat. The owner's hat is where we take distributions on the, uh, you know, off of the, the profits, but as an operator store manager, that's where they get paid a salary. Um, we, at TGK have owner operator meetings every single month um, and talk about new things coming up that we want to do, marketing stuff, training, different things like that. So in those meetings, we talk about, all right, what's going on? Is there any inconsistencies anywhere? All right, this is what we got to do. Here's how we got to fix it. And then I got those guys and gals go out and and do that right but for me it's a little bit easier for accountability back to the policy procedure deal just like 
the the owner operator because they have skin in the game, right? Mm-hmm. So hey, you own this shop with me. Here's what we're gonna do. You said you're gonna do it. They go out and do it because it's it's their deal, right? Yeah. Through the rapid growth and with that mentality for a lot of these guys and gals was not ever owning a shop or having skin in the game. It was just running a location, right? So it wasn't the same as if it was their own or, or part of mine with literally my name on it. Um, so the consistency and accountability was through the growth. That was tough, right? Mm-hmm. For the last two two years, that's really stuff that we focused on all the time. Hey, if you come to this shop and then go to this shop, it needs to be the same for us. It's yeah. the same brand. Um, so those policies and procedures being enforced and the people held and held accountable was was a lot of work. It wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. About it almost a year ago, it really started to click and people were on it, right? But it was just the the message of whether it was us with our owner operators or a guy with regionals and and managers it's this isn't this is who we are this is who we all work together with this is our message this is our team this is our culture this is who we are this is how it has to be and really hitting home on that and whoever's the end all be all needs to make sure that that's really honed in and enforced down to the team members because if not you're just you know chasing your tail and that's 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 a work always a work in progress um fortunate for us we have owner operators with a lot of awesome awesome people and they go to their stores and and make sure that that stuff happens so it's for me i i do acquisition stuff and that's pretty much all i do i'm a part of the owner operator meetings but i'm i'm involved in finding stores and, and opening stores up and and that's kind of my job right so I'm not involved in the day-to-days and we don't have regionals um, and we don't have district managers we got guys in the stores that get who we are and where we're going and what we're doing and and they hold their people accountable for that so yeah and no, I, I think that's a great strategy in terms of them having skin in the game makes them a little bit more responsible and a little more, I guess, prideful of what is happening at their current shop and how it affects what they, they can bring home as well. So right. I love that. And actually led me to another question and you kind of hit on that a little bit in terms of what you're currently doing and focusing on acquisition. So I was curious of if you, you find the location and then you handpick an owner operator to then run it, or if like the owner operator, like someone just within the ranks of the company is like now ready to be an owner operator. Do they go and find the shop and you kind of approve what they do? Like how, what does that look like? So we have a a few people thus far that have been with us as technicians or service advisors that I have one, well, the last four locations have all been people that were already working within the company. one technician that still wrenches and he has people that work up front with him um, or for him. And the other ones have all been service writers or service managers at some of our current locations that, you know, goes back to the, to the people person or the, yeah, the people portion of, Hey, I'm really, really good at what I do and they're showing it in their store and they're either going to go do their own thing or always continuing to figure out how they can get more within the company that they're at. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually in a business, if they're working for the business, they're going to max out. Right. Because a person can only get so much. You can only make, so much to give somebody you know so eventually they they max out and if they're that good they're either going to go start their own shop on their own own or we can give them opportunity to do something with us so 
we have a bench of, of people like that as well. People have seen what we've been doing in this industry in Minnesota. And now in, in Arizona, we have a deal on our website, you know, become a shop owner. We get a decent, well, not a ton, but we get a few emails yeah. um, of people acquiring. I just got two of them about the Arizona market. Um, but we also have people within this company that know our company. They know our culture. They love what they do. And I would not want to lose them to somebody else, right? So if those people do want that opportunity, which a few of them do, that's who gets that next opportunity before we bring somebody new in. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody that may want that opportunity that's new, that's come from a referral of a friend, we don't actively go and look for owner operators because, you know, it's a, as many people could relate, people don't want, most people don't want partners. And that's not what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but we're able to do stuff that we're doing to give people the opportunity to, to own their own business, right? And, and we get to be a part of it. So to be able to have open doors up or give that opportunity has been awesome. Um, and I don't want to partner with the wrong person, right? Because I don't want bad things to happen. So, hey, we don't need to grow anymore. And it's never been something we've been proactively looking for people to do so. Mm -hmm. Then, hey, so-and-so, I know this guy, I've worked with them. They want to come and be on the team. I vouch for them, you know, that doesn't mean they come here and own a store with us, but they might come in and, and run a store and earn that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And those people that are emailing in off of the website or, or calling in, we'll give the opportunity to our current team members and then bring those new people in and let them get acclimated with who TGK is and, and what we do. And if they fit, and it works out and it's still something they want to do, then that opportunity is there for them in the future. But make sure our, our people that are already with us get that opportunity before anybody else does. And I love that. I mean, it literally gives everyone that works at your company a, a, a path of limitless opportunity because being an owner allows you that capability. And so you truly are changing people's lives and I love that. And so congratulations on what you've been, been able to build. Thank you. Um, yeah. And so, and I mean, this, this has been an amazing uh, discussion so far. Thank you for being, being on this with me, but so kind of just to, to end this, um, I always like to ask um, owners what kind of their biggest influential books are that then other owners can also read and help them develop as, as owners of, of shops themselves. And so if you had kind of a, a top recommendation or if you have multiple recommendations, what, what would that be in terms of kind of a book um, that's made a big impact on, on you and that's helped you kind of shape your, your business? Hmm. I don't, uh, don't read too many books. No, no worries. No, that's a big thing, right? Like I'm in the in the Transformers group, and a lot of they, a lot of, I know a lot of people read books. And I just, I don't, I necess, I don't really uh, read a ton of books. I'm really been uh, boots on the ground, hands on, um, and and learning through you know other people with experience. I spend a lot of time with successful people. Um, not only in the automotive industry, but outside of it. So it's more of myself uh, interacting with with people and, and networking and, and talking um, to different people with different successes. And, and most of those people are, are older than me and wiser than me mm -hmm. and have more experience, right? So trying to feed off of them and, and learn you know, what's worked and what, what hasn't worked, um, not only in the automotive deal, but in the real estate side of things and kind of shifting along that, which, which comes down the, uh, lines of, of growth, right? Cause with growth, obviously you have acquisitions and real estate stuff and when to own the real estate, when not to, and, and kind of been, really in the last five years focused on that and working with a couple of guys here in the twin cities that have taught me a ton 
on that stuff. And to me, that's something new. So I can fix vehicles and, and write service and run an automotive repair shop. But the real estate side of things or investment side of things is something that was new to me. So mm -hmm. me being more engaged in that, and reading different articles, um, you know, whether it's online or on the newspaper stuff, reading that kind of stuff is, is, is how I stay engaged, but more so almost like a mentorship. Right. So yeah, absolutely. a couple of guys that I've been working with that, that keep me, my mind turning and, and intrigued to keep doing other things. So no. Uh, that, and that's great. I think we might need to get you back on and just talk about the real estate aspect of, of shops. That's a whole different ball game that I'm sure yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, I could. We could not have another there. 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we definitely could. Well, awesome. This this has been absolutely great. So thank you so much for for being on with on here with me today. And so, but if if any listeners want to reach out to you and maybe get some advice from you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Um, probably email would be the best way. Okay. My email is pretty easy. It's uh, Troy at tgkauto.com. Awesome. Yeah, that's my email address. I also, um, I know, I think you said you're talking to Mr. Greg Bunch next week. Mm -hmm. um, I know Greg Bunch and myself, I, I um work with Greg in the Transformers Institute. So there's people that reach out out that way as well through Greg or through Transformers itself or been at a lot of different events with the group and and Greg and I are starting to work more and more together with uh, Greg and myself and Brian Sum um, talking about multi-shop and how to go multi-shop and go multi-shop good is uh stuff i've been doing with him because that is something when i'm not doing acquisitions it's something that i like to do is is help and help other people out and see people get successful as well you know that's kind of why we've done our owner operator deal so follows hand in hand that's kind of fun for me absolutely all right well thank you so much troy and for those listening uh, up to this point, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, if you haven't subscribed to us, please click on the subscribe button below. But again, um, we'll have you guys on for the next one. See ya. Thank you.